should be an interesting next few months for sure. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with contrarian macro analyst David Hunter. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with David, in which he outlined his rationale for forecasting a record market melt-up to happen soon, to then be swiftly followed by an 80% market crash, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment perspective that David and I, as well as our partners at New Harbor Financial share in this video. And please take just a moment to support this channel by first liking this video and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Doing so will help this video reach a lot more viewers. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with David Hunter. Let's let's put our investors hat on now. Let's actually talk about um, you know how to ride this thing, right? So everybody watching has been listening to what you've been saying, David, and, and probably oscillating between, oh my God, that sounds amazing to, oh my God, that sounds horrible. Uh, but the big question that they're all asking is, is how do I make it through this thing? A, you know, alive with my wealth intact and B, you know, maybe better off than I am today if there's opportunity here to, to you know, participate in that melt up before everything goes down. Um, let me underscore, you're not a financial advisor. Uh, not asking you for personalized financial advice here, but you know, general brush, broad strokes. Um, uh, you know, what are some general strategies that people should be considering here? So it sounds like, and let me put some things out there, and you can you can react to them. But it sounds like you're saying, look, for people that have dry powder, you know, cash on the sidelines or or, or investments in the market that that you know can be deployed. Um, you know, don't risk more than you can afford to lose, but you may want to be a little bit more invested. And, and I don't use the word aggressive, but, but I guess I'll just sort of say leaning into the markets, um, kind of starting now, it sounds like what you're saying is, Hey, you know, we're, this is a good entry point for the melt up right here. You want to get in, you know, at S and P 4,300, not S and P 5,500, if it's going to 6,000. Um, and sounds like you're saying the more speed speculative, growth-oriented parts of the market will probably perform better than the more defensive ones. Um, anything other than that that you'd say people should be considering in, in preparation for the melt-up? Um, yeah, again, I have to walk very carefully as a strategist versus an advisor. So um, what I will say is um, that I'll, I'll put it in context of of the things that I think are going to be at the top of the list. And the, I think semiconductors are going to perform extremely well. I think, um, you know, the metals and mining areas going to do very well. I think, I think the copper producers are going to do very well. Um, I would say um, autos, airlines, um, industrials are all there. Um, so from a perspective and, and then I think you will have some of the you know faster growth stuff do well. So I more than telling people where to put their money, I would just say, beware. There's going to be a lot of voices out there confusing you. There's going to be a lot of people looking uh, an awful lot of of what you get out there in terms of chatter is backward looking. So people are ten ten when when something like um, the high growth area gets hit as hard as it does everybody turns bearish at the time when they probably should be looking at it as, hey, these things are so cheap now. So just be aware and don't, don't get too um, distracted by all the chatter out there that's you know, more often than not looking backwards, not forwards. Um, that's not exactly what you were looking for, but I, I gotta be careful as a forecaster, as a strategist. Um, the other thing I will say is, um, you know, my numbers, I'm pretty confident with my numbers in terms of, you know, S&P to 6,000, NASDAQ to 20,000, Dow to 45,000. Those are, those are big moves from here, but I'm not, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I could be wrong. So do not use the numbers as your get out point and say, well, he told me it was going there. So it must be going there. Um, you know, as you start feeling uncomfortable with the risks, 
just know there's a lot on the other side that you won't want to ride it all the way back down. Um, so again, everybody has to kind of find that point for themselves. But if you're getting nervous uh, as you you know see the thing really take off, um, you know you got to sleep at night. Um, the other the other thing um, is on the other side of this, um, the things that I think are going to perform in the bear market in the bust are the two things I think we'll appreciate uh, during the bust are US treasuries and the US dollar. Now I've got a call of the US dollar falling from, you know, current DXY currently up in the 96 and change area. I have it falling to 80 during this melt up or during the next six months. And then during the bust, I have it rising to 120. Those are my forecasts. So, so not straight from here, but but if the dollar does fall from there, the dollar will be a probably one of the few assets in the world appreciating during the bust. And U.S. Treasuries, I have them going from a two and a half percent ten-year rate, currently at you know 175 um, over the course of the melt-up sometime, and then falling to zero, a zero percent ten-year during the bust because it's a what I expect to be a deflationary bust. So, so the wow, <laughs> yeah. So the U.S. Treasury can be a place to hide, but not from here. You know, the bonds are going to deteriorate as rates go to go higher during the melt-up. But from from the top of the melt-up through the bust, the U.S. Treasury is probably going to be the the one asset to outperform everything else in the world. Um, and, and to appreciate while everything else has fallen apart. So there are places to hide, just not very many of them. Okay, um, and, and obviously cash is a place to hide during yes, the bust, yeah. right? Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, for those who, who think the bust is nigh and are trying to, to plan for it, I'm putting shorts off the table for a second. Um, uh, so cash, probably the easiest way to, to stay safe. Um, and of course, you know, the, the purchasing power of your cash rises dramatically on a relative basis if we have the type of correction you're expecting. Um, long I would just caution people, stay within that $250,000 FDIC threshold. I have- In I case have your bank fails. <laughs> yeah, I have zero worry that the FDIC won't have enough money to, you know, that they'll run out of money. They will be funded to whatever level is necessary in this cycle because we have the printing press and we have, you know, we'll have almost no inflation at that time. So, um, you know, as long as you're within that threshold, I have, you don't have to worry about, you know, geez, is the FDIC going to have enough to cover? Um, next cycle, that might be a concern, but not this cycle. Okay. Okay. Glad you mentioned that. Um, all right. So, cash, long dated US Treasury bonds. Um, and then just for people that are trying to understand, okay, what's the difference between investing in the dollar versus holding cash? Not asking you to give any specific um, recommendations, but I mean, there are ETFs and things like that that are sort of dollar strength ETFs, right? Yeah, for, for most people, I think probably, you know, they're not, they're not schooled in, in, you know, they're not really in a place to invest in, in the dollar. So, you know, treasuries are probably the better place, but it is. It is going to be, I think, one of you know two or three things that are going to appreciate during a period when the, all around the world everything is depreciating. So it's the only reason I bring it up. Okay, and, and folks watching, um, if you are interested in learning how to buy treasury bonds directly from the government, um, there's a, a service the government offers called Treasury Direct, which I'd be happy to create an explainer video telling people how to set up an account there, how to use it. It's actually quite easy, um, but it does help to have somebody sort of show you the steps. If that's something folks are interested in, just let me know in the comments section below. If there's enough interest, I'll, I'll create a video on that. Um, all right, David, well, look, as we wrap up here, I'd love to keep on going, but but sadly, we're, we're time bound here. Um, uh, so the uh, the... Washout plays out. We go down 70 or 80%. Um, at some point, the dust will settle. Uh, the sun will still rise the next morning. You know, plants will still grow. Birds will still sing, hopefully. Um, what does that world look like? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, there's a lot of people out there that think we're, you know, this is the down for account, down for the count um, cycle. 
And I don't think so. I think because of the response from the Fed and the government, which will be massive, as I say, you could see a balance sheet, the Fed balance sheet could grow to $30 trillion in the bust. Because of that kind of a response, there's gonna be a recovery cycle. And it will be, in, in, if you're in the right areas, it will be huge. If you're in the wrong area, it won't, it won't really be very good. But the leaders of this cycle, the FANGs, the you know, technology, uh, healthcare, you know, growth stocks, will not do all that well in the next cycle because the next cycle is going to be an inflation cycle because of all that money that's going to be created. Um, it will be an inflation cycle that I think will retrace the last 40 years of disinflation um, in, in probably seven or eight years. So you could go to 20% plus inflation. You could go to 15 to 20% interest rates. Um, you could go to... Um, you know, so and and you, and you can imagine that if you have interest rates going towards fifteen percent, growth stocks don't do well in that environment. Um, so, um, you know, the next cycle will be very heavily tilted in favor of commodities, industrial stocks. Um, you know, probably you know some areas like EV um, are obviously growth areas that will do well, but. But it's it's really going to be a very different cycle than what we've had in the last uh, you know ten or twenty years, where you know you you just all you had to own was the the fang stocks and and ignore them and they just went straight up. Uh, they're not going to have an easy time of it when interest rates are moving so rapidly to the upside. Okay, um, great. Well, thanks for painting that. Actually, I'm surprised you know you've got that much specificity there, but. Uh, David, if things play out the way that you're projecting here, uh, we'll have you back on long beforehand uh, to get more specific about <laughs> what things will look like if we've John just gone through the melt up or on our way through the, the meltdown or, or whatever. We'll have you back on anyways in a couple of months just to check in on how things are going. Um, what, one last question for you, um, and, and forgive me for asking it, but it's, it's, I, want, I want to cut some of the criticism, potential criticism off at the pass. Um, I think folks would say, if this guy's got this big of a bead on what's going to happen, um, how come he's not, you know, recording this interview, uh, sitting on the the diamond throne in his golden palace on his private island? Um, uh, what do you say to people like that? Yeah, I mean, I've spent forty eight years in the business, and I've certainly made plenty of calls that didn't work out. I've, I, you know, I've been, uh, I ran, I ran money for half my career as a pension fund manager, institutional manager, um, and had some some really good performance years, et cetera. But, but you know, uh, having spent 48 years, it, it does give you um, some wisdom and some, um, you know, the experience does pay off as you move along. This happens to be a cycle that I see clearly, and I state it. Um, you know, I don't, as you, as you see, this forecast is very unhedged. I don't hedge myself a lot if I have high conviction and I have high conviction on this, um, but I can be wrong. Um, and uh, you know, I am 70 years old and you know, semi-retired, certainly doing my own thing. Um, I made a point several years ago of saying part of what I'm gonna be doing is being on Twitter, providing a view that is not the conventional view to counter an awful lot of what's out there. I mean, I've spent a lifetime going against the crowd. Not always. I mean, I, sometimes I'm consensus, but uh, at turning points, I'm usually against the crowd. And I feel that's a voice that doesn't get heard very often at the important times when they should be heard. So it's, you know, helping the masses is part of what I do at this late stage of my life, or at least late stage of my career. Well, All right. Hopefully. And look, you, you, met, you mentioned your Twitter account there, which you are extremely accurate on, uh, active on. And uh, what I, I love about it beyond you continuing to share the specifics of your forecast uh, is you respond to lots of people. You know, you're one of those those people on Twitter that actually listens to the questions that the audience is asking and, and you know, given your bandwidth, answering them as many as possible. What's your Twitter handle? I'm sure it's uh, Dave H. Contrarian. So if you go to at Dave H. Contrarian, I'm, I'm on there most days. Um, and I will tell you, there's, there's plenty of people out there who uh, I find the ones that really have the hardest time with my view 
are traders, um, and particularly day traders. I mean, I, they, they expect my calls to be realized in the next day or the next week. A lot of times I'm making a call that goes against what's happening in the, in the next few days. I'm not, I'm not worried about what's going to go on, you know, in the next day or week or two weeks. It's, I'm looking out further. And so I think traders do not buy options based on my calls. Because uh, I think that's that's where a lot of the trouble comes. Is people think it's going to happen immediately. My stuff takes time. All right. Well, David, look, thank you so much for sharing so much detail with us uh, on your macro outlook here. Um, as long as you continue to be uh, as 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 a, just going to use the word eerie, but but you know you're you're, you're you've been so close to the mark uh, for you know so frequently recently. Um, it's been impressive. And as long as your arrows continue to, to get near that bullseye, uh, we'll keep bringing you back here on the program. Hope to have you back on in a couple of months. Really interested to see what happens in the interim. But uh, in between, I look forward to following you on Twitter, David. Okay, thanks, Adam. It should be an interesting next few months for sure. <laughs> all right, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> well, all right, another great session with David Hunter and his incredibly bold predictions that just seem to get more bold every time I have him on here. Now's the time on the program where we bring in the lead partners of New Harbor Financial to talk a little bit with them about their reaction to what David just said. John, let's start with you because you sent over some charts that you had prepared based upon some of what David said there. Um, so look, we got, uh, depending on which day you measure from, 35, 40% uh, epic melt up to look forward to from here over the next couple of months, if David's right, to be then followed by a 70 to 80% market crash. What do you think? Yeah, so Adam, I guess it's, uh, we'd like to talk about a couple of things. Certainly David's uh, you know big picture cyclical contrarian forecast, which is... Uh, you know what what the subject of the video we just saw is about I'd like to talk about that but also we can't we can't be we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the recent um you know, intraday reversal in the markets uh earlier this week on monday the whatever the date was there the 24th i think it was um look i mean it was pretty pretty obvious uh set of technical factors that um most anybody with eyes and an understanding of, of basic technical analysis uh, could have seen, would have seen, and you know, would not have been surprised by it, um, ourselves included, frankly. We were uh, very much looking at the oversold nature of the market uh, and had some pretty vigorous um, you know, debates on, on whether we should make some short-term tactical trades. The, the reality is, and I, I, I found myself accidentally watching CNBC this morning, there was a technical ana analyst on that basically said, look, in technical analysis, the things that got you uh, moving higher you gotta, you gotta, you gotta adhere to those things um, to avoid going lower. And th there's definitely been a character change in this market, both from a technical standpoint and a longer-term sense. You know, broke through the 200-day moving average, for example, pretty convincingly. But on a short-term basis, we would have agreed with everybody else, including yourself, Adam, that uh, there was a, a very high likelihood of a short-term bounce. But the caveat to that is, you know, where's that bounce likely lead to? You know, that was a fairly measured uh, likely bounce. Uh, heading into for what we'd be remiss to say is probably the most important Fed meeting in a long time, if, if not in the last decade. Um, so the, the modest upside, uh, we think that move in the short term oversold nature, provided we ultimately didn't believe that it was worth uh, much of a material change there. And, and uh, so anybody that, you know, thinks that that, that technical indicator was sufficient enough to put all the chips on the table, we think that is, is missing a bigger picture. Now to David's point, um, actually, before we move on that, that, I shared you a chart there, Adam, with uh, some history of the NASDAQ on, on days um, where there's been more than a 40%, I mean, a 4% drop that had been reversed. And you can see that on the chart here, there's a handful of seven days in, in recent history. And you know, it shows the subsequent returns uh, you know, a day, a week, a month, three months, and one year later. Now, in, all, in pretty much all cases, uh, out to about three months, there was a, a, a negative return from, from that reversal, meaning that that short-term pop was just that, a very short-term pop. And out one year, most of these dates were, were met with very healthy positive returns, with the exception, of course, of uh, October of 2000. And that's the only data point that's even remotely similar today, because that, that was at very high valuations, in fact, lower valuations than we even have now. Whereas all the other dates in here were, were near the lows. The, the, these were after the market had sold off quite a bit and valuations were far less extreme than today. So 
So, you know, if, if we looked at this set of data as, you know, the likely guide for the future, that one data point of the 2000, uh, October 2000 would be the most relevant and that portends very disappointing uh, longer term returns and shorter term, term returns from here. Now to talk about David's thing, you know, um, look, and he was the first to say that he's a strategist, not an advisor, not a, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, an investment advisor. And he says, you know, look, this is this is going to be the, the most face ripping rally, I believe, that we've ever seen, but but not because it's a sound market. In fact, quite the opposite, because it's an unsound market that is absolutely controlled by distortions and psychology. And guess what? It's going to be followed by the, the worst bear market in, in history. And the second chart I, I provided for, for viewers here is, is a, you know, kind of a look at them, what we think is the most similar uh, episode, actual historical episode to what David's talking about. And that's the blow off top in the NASDAQ in, in the 1999 to 2000 period. If you look here, if you had bought in October of 2090, uh, October 1999, by April of 2000, that would have been an 81% cumulative gain in that short period of time. We're talking about what, uh, four, six, seven months, right? Um, but you know, if you zoom out to where the low was in, in, in 02, even if you had bought at that time and, and had an 80% positive gain, the ultimate um, decline would have taken, given you a net loss of about 65%. Okay, because the collapse on the other side wiped out all the gains and, and then a whole lot more. And even worse, and this speaks to David's comment about psychology ruling and, and that, um, you know, uh, the temptation, if you're not in for this, what could only be said as a gamble, really, from, from a standpoint of, of what the likely backside of this looks like. You know, if you waited just a few months in that, that um, tech bubble, and got in, say, for example, in January or February, your cumulative loss would have been closer to 80%, not 65%. So we're talking about, you know, vicious, vicious things that are, are if history is any guide, good luck trying to keep, you know, the, the, even, even a massive move higher because, uh, it, it, you know, history is pretty, pretty instructive on, on what that looks like. And then the final chart, and I, I apologize for going on here, final chart is just a, a quick, you know, um, you know, kind of math of what David's, you know, forecast, if you take at face value, looks like, you know, face ripping 36% additional upside from where we are today. Uh, but if you, if the 80% worst case follow through that he sees on the backside happens, not only would that 36% gain be wiped out, but you'd be left with a cumulative 73% loss. All to say is folks with real money, real lives that don't get in a second chance, you know, we urge you to, to not just take these sound bites as, you know, permission to, you know, go out and put all the chips on the table because it, history is, is very instructive what, the, what that could look like. All right. Thanks so much, John, for putting those charts together. Um, I want to, I'll, I'll come back and talk to you and Mike after I ask Mike this next set of questions about sort of how are you guys thinking about sort of positioning in the near term, um, you know, from David's perspective, this is probably a time to, you know, push chips on the table and ride this melt up. That's if he's right, obviously. And, you know, other other people, you know, talking with our other endorsed advisor, Lance, over the weekend, um, you know, he had said, hey, this is probably a, in the near term. If we do get some higher prices, it's probably a better opportunity to start selling off at some of these higher prices. So there's many different ways to interpret the current bounce that we're seeing happen this week. So I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking about doing for the New Harbor portfolio. But before we go there, Mike, feel free to add anything onto what John just said. But, you know, David is also expecting uh, for, you know, some of the same reasons, but also other other additional reasons. He's very bullish on the precious metals. Um, you know, I think his target on gold is 2,500, his target on, on silver is $50. Uh, the, this is sort of at the end of this melt up that, that he's predicting. Um, he expects the miners to basically double between now and then. Um, so he's, he's, he's very, very sanguine on, on the precious metals. Um, I'd love to kind of get your reaction to that specific part as well. Yeah, Adam, I'd be happy to address that and to at least try. And I, I'd like to maybe make a couple of the comments about other things that he said. There's, there's a lot of what he says that we agree with. And frankly, everything that he says is very plausible and very possible. We are in a market that's full of euphoria and is disconnected from fundamentals, I think, than any market has ever been, at least in this country. So sure, anything can happen, but particularly when 
we're already in a parabolic move higher, completely just detached from uh, valuations. And really 99% of the time, what everyone talks about on every channel, CNBC and, and even this channel and everywhere else in the media is the Fed. And for good reason, because the Fed's been driving things for over 10 years. Our belief is that's created a very, very dangerous situation, which has gone on admittedly longer than anyone would have expected, but almost certainly won't go on forever if history is any guy. Uh, spe specifically about gold, um, we too are big fans of, of the precious metal miners, um, with the caveat that no mention of an individual product is a recommendation. Um, I like to often say that GDX, the ETF that holds gold miners, is uh, an easy proxy to use to talk about the sector. So it's presently trading at around 31. It's been consolidating there for a long time. And um, gold itself has been consolidated in a, in consolidating in a long triangle that looks like it's trying to break out right now. We're at 1850 yesterday on gold. We'll pull back to about 1830 right now. We're just before the Fed meeting. So we'll see what happens afterwards. But it looks like it wants to break out and move higher. A measured move on gold brings it up to around 2,500. That should bring GDX as the proxy up towards uh, 50 to 60, close to a double. So, you know, gold goes from 18 to 2,500, certainly not a double, but due to leverage and multipl uh, multiplier effect, GDX should close to double if that happens. That's what we're looking at. And we think it's really one of the best, if not the best opportunities out there right now. One other thing I guess I'd like to agree with, or, or not necessarily agree with David on, but talk about is, is uh, his, his comment about bonds. He thinks that bond yields, I believe he said, are, may go higher near term to maybe 250 on the 10 year. That looks right to us, at least in the near term. Technically, it looks like there's pressure to the upside on that chart. So we would be cautious uh, with holding bonds at this level. Then he ultimately says that uh, he thinks they'll collapse to zero. That's totally possible. Um, from, from a trading perspective, from an investment advisor perspective, and I know there's others on your channel that maybe have the opposite view, that's what makes a market, but we think that higher yields are the risk near term, so therefore we'd be avoiding long-term bonds, at least for the near-term trade. So uh, we're really concentrating on the shorter end, treasury bills, and in cash. Uh, and that's all, I, I guess I'll pause there. Okay, great. Um... Uh, just on the topic of precious metals, there were two charts I saw recently that I just wanted to put up here. And I was thinking of you, Mike. Uh, the first one here is a, uh, a, a tweet by Tavi Costa uh, basically saying, hey, look, uh, the, the, the next big up leg in gold is going to happen. Uh, and he is showing the same um, bullish pennant uh, that you show every week, the, the wedge that you talk about. Um, so I'm just putting up that same wedge just here in one of Crescott's charts. So, you know, it's, it's not just your, uh, your interpretation, Mike, you've also got, uh, the guys at Crescott who are, you know, some of the, the biggest precious metals analysts out there thinking the same way. Um, and then, uh, Lynn, here's a tweet from Lynn Alden, um, which, uh, again, was sort of building off of Tavi's statement, um, where she has been tracking for a long time, you know, the, the cup and handle, uh, pattern that gold's been making. We've talked about it on this channel a couple of times. Um, it's funny, she sort of held it out there in the past as like a Rorschach test. You know, you could kind of look at it both ways. Either gold has kind of been flatlined for a long time uh, or that it's stitching out this cup and handle pattern uh, that would be very bullish. And she's basically thrown her hat in the ring and said, you know what, I'm now I'm, I'm with the folks now that are seeing the cup and handle pattern. Um, you know, I think gold's got a much brighter future ahead of it here. And I just want to bring those up because I love it when you know many different experts using their own methodologies come to the same conclusion because I think we can have a bit more confidence in the conclusion if multiple people are getting there by different paths. And just here, you know, we have David's big bullish statements. We've had the favorable statements you guys have been making for months on this program. We've got Tavi. We've got Lynn. Um, I'm sure I could find a bunch more out there, but you know, this just sort of all just came in basically today and, and doing a quick dial around uh, things I look at. So, um, uh, you know, gold's getting kicked in the teeth today. Uh, we're recording this on Wednesday, January 26th. Um, we this is the day that the FOMC issues its statement. They haven't issued it yet, so that'll probably um, create some interesting elements that we'll have to talk about next week. Um, but interestingly, whenever the FOMC issues a statement usually gold dives. <laughs> and I think gold just decided to just roll over early today <laughs> in advance of the statement. Um, so we'll see what'll happen here. Um, you know, this is, uh, 
this is not uh, rationality thinking, it's more emotion. But, but to me, my suspicion is sort of gold always sort of takes it on the chin right when the FM on the day the FOMC meets. And a lot of times that action's reversed within a day or two. And, you know, um, a suspicious minded person might think that they're, they're kind of trying to kick it down uh, to mute its response to, to eventual news that will be gold bullish. So anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll know for sure what the news is in just a couple of hours. But um, I do want to note that even though gold's stumbling today, there seems to be an increasing plethora of uh, experts and data points that suggest that uh, you know uh, the long-awaited next leg up higher in gold might might be nigh. Um, John, I'm going to bring it back to you real quickly in wrapping up here. Mike mentioned sort of already sort of mostly answered this question about sort of near-term uh, steps you guys are taking at New Harbor, but um, going back to the question that I flagged earlier. Um, uh, with a bounce here and then some debate over how long lived it may be. Are you guys making any material changes to the portfolio here that folks should know about? Yeah, so uh, obviously we're watching all things all the time. You know, we, uh, <laughs> the amount of work that goes into studying things uh, is, is not um, different depending on how much action or not there, there might ultimately be in client accounts. That, that's the decision not to act is an is a intensive and well thought out one. Um, but yeah, I mean, so for example, just to talk about, you know, I referenced, uh, you know, our two looking at the oversold nature, we electively decided to not um, immediately re resell some call options on some equity exposure that we have, because uh, we were expecting a kind of a short term bounce. Um, so we, we, you know, we'll, we essentially will, we'll, we believe there'll be a better time to sell some of those call options um, than where we were on Monday at the intraday low. Um, but likewise, on, on strength, we may be looking for opportunities to sell, sell call options. And, and on weakness, um, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the dynamic things about the hedging tools that, that we often use with, with options. You can make tactical changes in the hedges that effectively, um, in a very risk-contained way, um, capitalize on these short-term moves up and down and the volatility um, spikes and, and retractions that go along with those. Uh, right here and now, we don't, we don't envision any hugely material like massive shifts in allocation. Um, we're, we're in a very tight range here. You know, we think the if the S&P was at 4,300 to pick a number on, on, the, on the low or near the low on, on Monday, you know, the near-term upside resistance is at say 4,500, um, you know? Um, so there's not a huge near-term, uh, we think clear path for, for a spike higher. Obviously all bets are off with, with the Fed. Uh, you know, in terms of what kind of craziness they might invoke in the markets. But um, simple answer is no. Uh, while we're studying things and watching things, we don't see any any merit for any massive shifts in allocation right here and now. Okay, great. Very helpful for folks watching. And guys, I do just want to note with a lot of gratitude uh, the fact that we just had the Wealthy on conference this past weekend. You guys were my co-pilots for that. Uh, you spent the entire 10 hour day <laughs> with me, um, you know, listening to all the great speakers, providing a lot of great commentary and then doing uh, you know, practically an hour long ask anything uh, Q and A session at the end about all things money. Um, but anyways, I thought it was the best conference that we've had yet, but I'm curious to see what were some of your top takeaways from all the speakers there. Um, Mike, why don't we go to you first for this? Oh boy, it was it was a wonderful day. It puts me on the spot. I, I didn't prepare for this, but there's so so many wonderful, insightful speakers. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the highlights. There was, um, you know, you know, Lance Roberts had a nice piece that we enjoyed. Of course, that's in our industry, so we tuned into that, and he talked about, you know, the um, you know the nature of the, the the market being pretty difficult to navigate. He talked a little bit about. Um, you know, wanting to be more in long-term bonds. We actually probably disagree a little bit on that point, but I think we, we agreed on, on so many other things. Uh, I enjoyed the talk, and I, I can't remember the gentleman's name that talked about the, the cryptos uh, and the fact that there's basically companies that trade like equities uh, on the blockchain, which is kind of a completely different topic. It's frankly something that I wasn't too keyed into. I thought that was, that was neat. And it was just packed all day. It was, it was a long day. I think we went to almost seven o'clock Eastern time. And um, it's very difficult for me to, to, to actually to, to describe all of the highlights, but it was, it was a good day. 
Great, great. And by the way, that was Stephen McBride from Risk, yeah. Risk Hedge, who was the fellow who was talking about the phase two cryptos. And we're going to bring him back on this program more in the future. I know we put you on the spot there, Mike. How about you, John, now that you've had a few seconds to think about it? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the best uh, litmus tests, Adam, is is how, um, how much stamina the, the, the crowd had. You know, when you do these Zoom meetings, you can see how many participants are there. And man, there were several hundred right from the get-go right through the very end. And, and that, I think, says it all. If people weren't enthralled and, and getting a great insight out of it, they would have, I'm sure, gone happily to a relaxing Saturday afternoon of the beautiful sunny day here in Massachusetts. So the fact that you know folks stayed clued in and, and tuned in, I think, says a lot. And, and the comments were, were very complimentary uh, across the board. You know, obviously, the I think the consensus or the broad takeaway, even though there was different disagreements on tactical moves or, or inflation versus deflation, I think the broad consensus was, is we got a kind of a, a beast of a stew of, of market and economic factors here that are undeniably um, in many ways unprecedented. Uh, absolutely. As, as Jim Grant said, it was one of my favorite quotes from the weekend, uh, it's a wild time in money. And uh, that guy should know he's been tracking you know, basically interest rates his entire long career. Um, so that really means a lot coming from him. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed how we had kind of a really interesting counterbalance of, you know, some of the the longest tenured, you know, economists and analysts out there with uh, Lacey Hunt and Jim Rickards and, and Jim Grant. And then it was, it was you know, counterweighted with some of the new up and comers, you know, folks like Luke Groman, Daniel DiMartino Booth, Stephen McBride, who we talked about, um, uh, Ivy Zellman, et cetera, uh, who were sort of, a, you know, a little bit of a younger generation uh, looking through a bit of a different lens, but, but in many ways, you know, still coming to a lot of the same fundamental conclusions. And pretty much everybody agreed that uh, volatility is going to reign in 2022, and the year has not disappointed so far. Um, so folks, if you're watching this but didn't actually watch the conference and you know maybe after hearing some of this feedback are interested in potentially uh, watching the replay videos of that, you can go get them uh, over at wealthion.com slash Jan 2022. Um, all right, guys, well, in wrapping up here, um, as we say every week, we don't know exactly what's going to happen next. Um, but whatever does happen, we'll be tracking it here closely together. Everybody watching, if you can, please just help support this channel. It just takes a second. Just hit the like button and then click the subscribe button below. John and Mike, thanks for joining me for yet another week here. I look forward to seeing you guys next week. And everybody else, thanks for watching. Thanks again, Adam. Great to be with you. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Adam. And we'll see you soon. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type, the kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. 
but for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching. Thank you.